Okay, well, welcome everyone. Good evening and welcome to this uh, third episode already of the second season of the Late Night Conference. Uh, my name is Bill M. Huck and I'm your host tonight. It's uh, great to have a live audience again. Uh, I know you're there, I can't see you because the lights are in my face. Um, I'm also welcoming the people who are uh, in the YouTube uh, channel and please remind, uh, to remind you, if you have questions, put them on the chat and we will pick them up uh, later on. As you know, this season, we are going to talk about artificial life. And last month, we had John Glass of the Craig Venter Institute telling us everything about a synthetic cell made by minimizing a genome and transplanting that genome into a host cell, which is a truly tremendous achievement for science. So, um, at the same time, I think you will agree with me that the actual internal components of that synthetic cell looked remarkably like every other cell that uh, is out there and indeed like the host organism that the um, uh, cell, the genome was transplanted into. Today, we are really going to talk about artificial life. And we are talking about artificial life, life as, uh, uh, well, it's life, but not as we know it. We're going to talk about robots, artificial intelligence, robots made out of cells, uh, maybe robots even with their own intelligence. Our guest tonight is Professor Josh Bongard from the Professor of Computer Science of the University of Vermont. And Josh is a computer scientist. Uh, he trained at McMaster University in Canada. And then after a short stay in the UK for a master's, he went to uh, Zurich to do his PhD. And the title of his PhD was the combined evolution of a robot's body and brain, which really tells you already in which direction we are talking today. Um, after a postdoctoral stay at Cornell University, he took up his uh, faculty position at the University of Vermont uh, in 2006. And since then he has built a really thriving uh, research group in evolutionary robotics. Uh, he has won many awards. He was named MIT's top 35 innovator under 35. Uh, he was also awarded a Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers by Barack Obama. And you really should check out his website because you can see him sitting um, a little bit uh, behind Barack, uh, uh, all smiles, of course. Uh, um, if you do check out his website, you also have to um, watch out for the group mascot. Uh, as you know, our group has a very cuddly uh, Sammy the Labrador, uh, not the unicorn, but Sammy the Labrador as our mascot. If you go to Josh's website, he has a, an evil starfish uh, robot as the group uh, mascot. So, so that means we're all warned. Um, I think we're ready to start. Uh, just, uh, um, I think, uh, uh, handing over the, uh, the Zoom to Josh, and we're looking forward to your talk. Uh, Josh, Zoom is yours. Thank you so much, Willem. Thanks very much for that uh, introduction. Uh, thanks to all of you for attending. Uh, I wish I could be there in person. I, I look forward to our questions and answer session in about 30 minutes. So uh, good evening to you uh, in the Netherlands and good afternoon from here at the University of Vermont. Uh, I'm Josh Bongard. I'm very excited to be uh, a part of your late night conference series on artificial life. I've worked in the area of artificial life for a long time. Happy to answer questions about what the field of artificial life is uh, in the Q&A session. I'm particularly excited to tell you about uh, our most recent contribution to artificial life, which is the Xenobot, uh, arguably the world's first computer designed organism. Um, it was my distinct honor to be a member of the team that created the first Xenobots. Um, but before I tell you about the team and before I tell you about Xenobots, if you'll permit me to tell you a little bit about myself, um, Wilhelm invited us uh, speakers to tell you a little bit about our journey to becoming a scientist. And uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my journey. Uh, it started at McMaster University in Canada. I'm Canadian. Uh, I went to school in Canada and I, as Willem mentioned, I did an undergraduate in computer science. Um, during my degree, I took a couple of courses in biology and uh, one, uh, one late night at the library, I was studying for a genetics exam. I got a little bored, got up to stretch my legs and was walking around the library and came across this particular uh, book with this very curious title, 
genetic programming um, on the programming of computers by means of natural selection written by uh, John Koza. And as I flipped through this book, I learned that this particular computer program or this particular type of algorithm called genetic programming is an algorithm or a program that evolves other programs. And in one of the chapters of this book, this is one of the evolved computer programs. Um, it doesn't look much, probably doesn't look much like a computer program you've ever seen before. Um, there's several reasons for that. One of them is that this is written in Lisp. Lisp used to be the program, uh, the programming language of choice for artificial intelligence. It no longer is. Um, it also has some other strange structure to it. Um, these particular computer programs were evolved to control a virtual ant. And in the interest of time, I won't show you the ant itself. Um, we have a population of computer programs. Each program is invited to control the ant. And depending on how well that program controls the ant, how well it gets the ant to find food, pick up food, carry food, bring food back to the nest, um, programs that do a poor job of controlling the ant, ants that starve, those computer programs are deleted and the surviving computer programs produce randomly modified copies of themselves through mutation. So uh, this idea of combining computer science and evolutionary biology uh, really sort of lit a, lit a fire in my brain. I found this idea particularly exciting. And I remember, uh, I remember in particular leafing through this book and seeing this particular picture of this computer program. And it, again, as an undergraduate in computer science, it didn't look anything like any code I'd ever seen before, but it did look a lot like the DNA that I had just been studying in my genetics textbook for my genetics exam. And so again, this, this odd mixture of biology and, and coding really, really kind of interested me. Um, here's a more recent example. I pulled this off of YouTube uh, yesterday. This is genetic programming today. Um, it is still evolving populations of computer programs. In this case, each computer program has been tasked with drawing a picture, and it's allowed to draw or paint a picture with just a very limited budget of circles. And the fitness or the quality of any one computer program, the chance that it will survive and produce offspring, is dependent on how well it can paint a picture of a particular person. And if I let this video play for a couple more seconds, you should probably be able to figure out which particular person the computer pro programs are evolving to, to paint. I'll jump ahead a few, uh, a few seconds here. You can see at this point in the evolutionary process, the programs are get, getting pretty good at painting uh, Mona Lisa with just a few circles. So um, I was very excited about this idea of evolutionary algorithms. Uh, or so when I finished my undergraduate degree, I flew across the ocean to uh, the UK and I found one of the very few graduate programs at the time um, that offered training in this combination of computer science and evolutionary biology. This is the EASY program. It definitely was not an easy program. Uh, e stands for Evolutionary and Adaptive uh, Systems. And I was very lucky for the year that I spent doing my master's degree at Sussex to be tutored by these three people. Um, Anil Seth, bottom center here. Uh, Anil has since become one of the world experts in uh, consciousness studies. Uh, he has some great TED Talks and books on the subject. And from Inman Harvey in the center and Philip Husbands on the right here, I learned about a particular kind of evolutionary algorithm or a particular approach to evolutionary systems called evolutionary robotics. Here's one of my early projects uh, in evolving now, evolving not computer programs, but evolving brains for robots. So in this case, we have a population of evolving brains. We drop each brain into the virtual robot, one brain after another, and the evolutionary algorithm watches how well that given brain controls the robot. Brains that cause the robot to drop the object or cause the robot to move away from the object, those brains are deleted and the surviving brains produce randomly modified copies of themselves. And as you can see in this video over evolutionary time, the brains are evolving to better control the robot, to find and manipulate an object that's placed further and further away from the robot. So that's evolutionary robotics. Instead of programming a robot by hand or training it to learn something, we're evolving the brains of these uh, robots. 
I got really interested in this idea of evolutionary robotics and decided that after my master's degree, I wanted to study this idea in much more detail. So uh, I flew across the uh, English Channel, in this case, to Switzerland and started my PhD in Rolf Pfeiffer's lab at the University uh, of Zurich. Uh, Rolf has since retired, but he is and what he was and is uh, a world expert on uh, what's known as embodied cognition. And embodied cognition is actually an idea borrowed from psychology into robotics, which is the idea that brains do not equal intelligence or said differently, brains are not enough to produce intelligent behavior. We are now in the middle of an AI revolution uh, here in the US, Facebook and Google and a lot of other Silicon Valley companies are trying to make larger and larger electronic brains, otherwise known as deep learning networks, uh, inside larger and larger computers. And the unspoken assumption under all that work is that if you make a big enough brain, you'll make a smart enough computer. But of course, in the animal kingdom, ourselves included, uh, animal bodies and human brains are not obstacles to intelligence. They don't sort of get in the way of brains. Bodies are an essential part of learning to be intelligent. We use our bodies to push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. That's the idea of embodied cognition. So in my PhD, I took my understanding of evolutionary robotics and tried to use evolutionary robotics to better understand embodied cognition. Here, another video taken from some of my PhD work now. In this case, we have now broadened the evolutionary algorithm so that it is no longer evolving computer program or evolving just the brains of robots. We've broadened the evolutionary algorithm so that now we're evolving populations of robots and evolution through mutation and sexual recombination is tinkering with bodies and brains. Evolution is able to modify the body and or the brain of, uh, of robots in this evolving population. And you get robots with kind of interesting, strange looking shapes and behaviors. These are definitely not a very efficient robots, but what you're watching is, evolutionary, is evolution exploring virtual life inside a computer? What are the ways in which we can build intelligent uh, machines? When I finished my PhD, uh, Rolf and I published a book together called How the Body Shapes the Way We Think. And in this book, we describe evolutionary robotics and the relationship between body and brain and uh, intelligence and how we might evolve machines to have better bodies and use those better bodies to better push against the world and observe how the world pushes back and become capable of useful and safe operation in the real world, which is sort of the end goal for most roboticists. Okay. When I finished my PhD, uh, I was convinced that I belonged in academia, not in industry. So uh, before becoming a professor myself, I spent two more years uh, in Hod Lipson's lab at Cornell University, which is in upstate New York, uh, in Ithaca, New York, another particularly beautiful part of the world, in my opinion. And uh, Hod and I spent two years working on the robot that uh, Hod is holding here. This robot became nicknamed the evil starfish. Uh, William already mentioned our lab mascot. Uh, I think you can sort of see how it, how it acquired its nickname. We built the evil starfish uh, in response to a NASA project where NASA was particularly interested in embodied cognition, the relationship between body and behavior for a very specific NASA re reason, which is, if we send robot probes to uh, the outer planets or moons of the solar system and the robot's body changes, it undergoes damage or wear and tear or sand gets into a motor where it shouldn't, um, there's no humans there to fix the robots. And as far as we know, there's no little green men there that can fix the robots for us. So the robots are gonna have to adapt to changes in their own bodies which is again, something that animals and uh, humans do particularly well. Uh, your body is changing all the time for the, the particularly young members that are uh, in the audience today. Your bodies are changing greatly and you are adapting and learning how to do new things, new behaviors, new sports, play a new instrument, write uh, computer programs in a new, uh, new computer language, 
all while your body and brain is changing. Our machines that we build are not very good at that. Um, so the evil starfish was designed to be able to continue operation even as its body changes. Here's phase one of uh, a project involving the evil starfish. In this case, the evil starfish was communicating with an evolutionary algorithm. That evolutionary algorithm was evolving brains for the evil starfish. And here's the best brain that evolved for the evil starfish. Uh, the goal or the mission of this robot is simply to move from the left side of the table to the right side of the table. Here's an evolved brain controlling that robot. But what happens if something goes, what happens if something goes wrong? So what happens if this is a prototype of a robot uh, probe and on entry and landing on the surface of another planet, part of one of the robot's legs breaks off. You can see that the right hand leg has actually been pulled off of the robot. It's actually hanging off the side. That evolved brain no longer works. What the evil starfish does is before it tries to figure out how to walk again, because it can no longer walk in the way it walked before, it evolves not just a recovery strategy, it evolves a new understanding of itself. As this damaged robot is moving, it's collecting sensor information and learning that that sensor information suggests that it's not missing its left leg, it's not missing its forward leg, uh, it hasn't stuck its leg in mud. What the explanation, the best explanation for what's happened is it's lost part of its right hand leg. The evil starfish has no camera, it can't see itself, it has no pain receptors, it can't feel the fact that part of its leg is missing. Through movement, through pushing against the world and feeling how the world pushes back, robot gets enough information to evolve a new self image, a better understanding of itself. And once it's evolved a better self image, once it knows that it has three and a half legs rather than four legs, it can evolve a new compensating gait. So the way the three and a half legged starfish moves is very different from the way it moved before when it had four legs. So in a way, this is one of the first machines that when it is broken, it is able to kind of fix itself. It's not perfect. It moves much slower and much less uh, energy efficiently than it did before. But unlike most of our machines, which when they break, they stay broken, this robot has enough evolutionary intelligence on board to figure out a new way to continue on with its mission, which of course is something that's very important to NASA as it sends robots into very, very remote environments. Uh, when I finished up with HOT at Cornell, I was very lucky to be offered my own faculty position here at the University of Vermont. Um, I'm here in my office looking out my window. I don't have quite this view. This is the provost's view. The provost always has the best view from campus, but uh, if you do get a chance to visit Burlington, Vermont, it is a, a very nice corner of the world and we'd be welcome. We'd be happy to, to welcome you for a visit. So uh, aside from the nice views, one of the nice things about being a faculty member on campus is you get to work with lots of great uh, young people. Here's a snapshot of just some of my past uh, and current students. And I'm gonna tell you now about a more recent project uh, I carried out together with my then PhD student, uh, Sam Kriegman. Sam and I teamed up with two biologists, Mike Levin and Doug Blackiston, both who were at Tufts University. Uh, Tufts is just north of Boston in Massachusetts. And the four of us uh, submitted a proposal to DARPA. Um, DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. It is the research wing of the US Department of Defense. Uh, at that time, DARPA had put out a call for ideas about lifelong learning. Um, a lot of groups are interested in trying to create machines that can continuously learn as they behave. Current robots don't work that way. Um, most robots are not capable of lifelong learning. We train our robots for hours or days or weeks or months in the lab and then send them out into the real world, cross our fingers and hope that the robots are useful and safe in real world environments like they were in the lab. Unfortunately, that's not often the case. 
animals and humans, we are very good at learning as we behave. That's lifelong learning. So uh, this program uh, attracted a lot of different teams like our team that was a, some combination of biologists and roboticists to study how organisms lifelong learn and figure out how to take those ideas and build them into robots. We started our, we got some funding to work on this and we started our collaboration about three years ago now. And whenever you're doing interdisciplinary work, when you have scientists coming together from different branches of science and engineering, it takes months uh, and sometimes years to be able to learn what each member of the team is capable of and how to put all of that expertise together. So we started out with some weekly Zoom calls and we started uh, in one of the first Zoom calls with Sam uh, presenting some of his most recent work at the time. Uh, three years ago, we were mostly focused on simulating soft robots. Here you can see one of Sam's uh, soft quadrupedal robots. These robots are made from uh, voxels or 3D pixels. You'll notice these voxels themselves are quite soft. You'll notice Sam has cut this quadruped in half. Uh, in my lab, for some reason, we like to torture robots. We like to pull off legs and see how they recover. Uh, in this case, you can see the robot isn't able to recover very well. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. One of the nice things about soft robots is they can adapt not just their brains, but their bodies. You can see this particular robot has adapted its body to recover after losing 50% of its body. Uh, we work with another group at Yale. Uh, this is Rebecca Kramer Botiglio's lab. And at the Yale lab, they actually build physical versions of our soft robots out of these uh, soft silicone voxels. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have time today to talk about uh, the soft robots they're building at Yale. Um, I suggest you Google the Fabulatory uh, and check out some of the amazing work they're doing there. Anyways, in this project, we showed uh, Mike and Doug, our biology colleagues, this video. The next week, Doug, who's a microsurgeon, showed us this image on that week's Zoom call. What Doug had done is been inspired by our soft uh, quadrupedal robot. Doug had uh, looked through the microscope and he had pulled off a few frog cells from very early frog embryo and put those cells together and made a, very, a millimeter sized sculpture of Sam's quadruped robot. This is not a Xeno bot, this is a Xeno sculpture. The cells, uh, the, the picture that you see here, this is a little uh, sculpture made from skin cells. The skin cells have no way of, of moving. So this little millimeter sized sculpture is simply floating in uh, room temperature pond water inside a petri dish under a microscope. The moment the four of us saw that, we forgot everything that we had been thinking about doing and we reoriented on seeing whether we could turn the Xeno sculpture into a Xeno bot. Could we get this thing to move? Doug told us that we could possibly get this thing to move by uh, combining two different cell types, the frog skin cells, which we modeled as uh, we modeled in our simulation as soft passive voxels. Uh, uh, Doug told us that he could also extract uh, stem cells from early skin uh, from early frog embryo that would develop into uh, heart muscle tissue and heart muscle tissue in a frog heart and in a human heart that tissue will uh, 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 on its own spontaneously increase and decrease in volume like a pump. So we took those two cell types and we de described those two cell types to our evolutionary algorithm as two different types of Lego bricks. We wanted the evolutionary algorithm to figure out a way to combine these two different Lego bricks in such a way to produce something that would move along the bottom of a simulated Petri dish. What you're looking at in these three animations, these are three of the initial random guesses that the evolutionary algorithm did, uh, came up with. The evolutionary algorithm created 100 random simulated xenobots by putting skin cells and heart muscle cells together in random configurations. And as you would maybe expect, hopefully expect, 
um, most of those random mashups of those two uh, Lego bricks don't move at all. They kind of uh, jiggle in place. You can see the light blue voxels acting like skin cells. They're being passively pulled and pushed by the red green voxels, which are spontaneously increasing and decreasing in volume. It turns out that among this population of 100 simulated xenobots, there are one or two that manage to move a, a few millimeters away from their starting position. Those are the survivors. All the remaining 98 solutions are deleted. And the evolutionary algorithm makes randomly modified copies of these two surviving solutions and repeats this process over and over again. And at the end of this evolutionary process, the evolutionary algorithm gave us back this solution, which it doesn't move very quickly, but it is able to walk along the bottom of the dish from left to right. You'll notice the particular solution that evolution has come up with. It's put the heart muscle tissue on the ventral or bottom surface and skin cells on the, the top half of this xenobot. This was the end of part one of the experiment. We've evolved a simulated xenobot. We sent this video to Doug and we challenged Doug to build a physical version of this xenobot. So uh, Doug got to work. Um, this is, uh, you're looking through the microscope now with Doug. What you're looking at are basically, these are frog eggs, um, long, long before they become uh, tadpoles. You'll notice that he's going to liberate or pull off uh, a small collection of cells from, uh, from these early eggs. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit now. In the next video, uh, Doug has extracted some of these uh, frog cells, these skin cells and heart muscle tissues, uh, heart muscle cells, and he's now going to use a syringe to uh, inject them into a very small uh, well, a very small hole. That's what the dark circle is that you see. So the cells kind of sit inside of this bowl. And uh, what you'll see in the next video is when we zoom in, individual cells don't like to be on their own. They actually kind of move around at random and they try and connect with their neighbors and they're kind of pulling themselves back into a ball or a mass of tissue. And as they're doing this, in the last stage, um, Doug is going to reach in with a few very, very small tools. Remember that this small mass of tissue is about one millimeter in diameter and very carefully Doug is scraping away some of the excess skin cells and heart muscle cells and he's creating the small stubby legs of the robot. The robot is actually flipped on its back at the moment he's making these legs and he's going to then grab it and put it on its leg quote unquote legs and it turns out that when he does that. When he did that in this case. The physical xenobot in the bottom half of this video moves more or less like the evolutionary algorithm predicted that it would. You'll notice that there's obviously some uh, some differences in the shape and the behavior of the simulated and physical xenobot, but it's pretty close. So that's the end of phase two of this experiment. Uh, we published these results. Uh, a little over two years ago now in January 2020. Um, so this first paper was just a demonstration that you could actually make xenobots. Since then, we've been showing what you can do with xenobots. Um, just this past December, we showed that xenobots, instead of having Doug make a xenobot, a xenobot can actually make another xenobot. You're looking at this dark xenobot and what it's doing, I'll put it on loop here for you so you can see it a little bit better is actually pushing individual skin cells that we've sprinkled into the dish. It's sort of mushing them into a pile. And if that pile becomes big enough, uh, it will grow cilia. Cilia are very small hairs, and the hairs actually allow uh, xenobots to swim. So these are not muscle xenobots, like the ones that I just showed you with heart tissue in them. These are just skin cells. If the piles have enough cilia and enough hairs, after a couple of days, the, this, uh, light, uh, this, light, this light patch of tissue will actually start moving on its own, and you have a child xenobot.
Okay, I have one minute left. So just to take a, a couple of steps back from Xenobots themselves. Xenobots are just one example of this new emerging field of synthetic biology. At the moment, uh, in all of biology, this is what we've had to work with, the tree of life. This is life as it is and life as it was. Um, this is an attempt to try and represent most of the major taxa, mo most of the major organismal groups that currently exist on Earth on the edge of this picture and have existed but are now extinct. This is life as it is. The field of artificial life, the unofficial slogan is life as it could be. What would happen if we discovered life on another planet? Or in the case of the xenobots, what happens if we kind of make our own tree of life? You'll notice this dashed line here is actually uh, connected to frogs. So xenobots are not strictly a completely new life form because obviously they are life forms that are built from frog cells. But as AI and evolutionary algorithms keep making new kinds of xenobots, how do those xenobots resemble and how do they differ from frogs and from all other forms of life that we know of. Together with Mike, uh, Mike's group at Tufts, we are now starting to build biobots from uh, cell types taken from other species. What other trees of life can we create? How, what will life look like when we allow evolutionary algorithms and other types of AI to combine and recombine uh, living tissue and living systems and genes and cell types? When mixing, mixing and matching them from different organisms, what is possible? How will life evolve given the opportunity to do so uh, again? I think I will stop there. Thanks very much for your attention, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions you have. Well, Well, that was mind boggling, I think, uh, especially uh, your outlook also for the future. If you say, well, how could life look in the future? Uh, that's, uh, that's a very fascinating thought. Um, I would like to thank you, first of all, for an amazing uh, presentation. And it's open for discussion uh, right now. So uh, I'm happy to, to give the microphone to somebody who has a question right in the middle over there. Uh, it would be nice if you state your name so Josh knows who's, who he's talking to. Okay, uh, I'm Giacomo, and my question is, uh, um, if uh, the xenobots made from uh, cells are able to modify their shape like uh, the xenobots you showed us from Yale, and what would be the advantage of using cells instead of uh, whatever material they're using at Yale that seems some plastic-like material or what? Uh, Giacomo, that's a fantastic uh, question. As a, as a computer scientist and as a kind of roboticist, I'm actually particularly interested in the materials from which we try and make uh, intelligent machines, right? If you look at the history of robotics, we have mostly used four different materials, steel, plastics, uh, ceramics, and I'm missing one. Uh, what's in batteries? Zinc, uh, zinc and, and iron, maybe four or five, depending on how you count. If you think about those materials, they are, of course, inorganic materials, and they are not themselves smart materials. They're inorganic. They're dumb. They have no intelligence of their own. But when you build robots from living cells, cells themselves, you could argue, are probably the most complex machines we know of. An individual cell is fantastically complex. The surface of a cell has lots of different sensing capabilities and receptors. A cell is able to deform its own shape. As you saw in one of the videos, cells are able to move themselves and attach to different uh, neighbors. So when you build a robot out of cells, you're actually building a machine out of machines. And those cellular machines have been tuned by evolution over 3.5 billion years. It, it, unicellular uh, organisms have been around for three and a half billion years. They have been tuned to withstand heat, cold, vibration, shock, meteor impacts, you know, you, you name it. The organism 
them might not survive, but cells, you know, are able to deal with very extreme behaviors. Um, I didn't have time. Uh, if you go, if you Google Xenobots, you'll find the web page we have dedicated to Xenobots. And on that web page, there's a video in which Doug, again, under the microscope, and under the microscope, cuts a robot almost in half. And that Xenobot over a few hours starts to stitch itself back together again and keep moving. I showed you the evil starfish and I showed you some of our soft robots. They can kind of recover, but it takes them thousands of attempts. They have to learn how to do so. They don't recover that well. Um, when, you build, when you build robots out of living materials, you inherit a lot of the intelligence and the robustness that organisms and cells have spent millions and billions of years evolving to, to be capable of. So I think there's, an, there's a really exciting future for many of you to explore how to build new kinds of machines and useful tools out of living materials. Great question, thank you. Sure. Maybe to follow up on that question, um, um, you use your, at the moment your evolutionary algorithm to essentially pre-program how you think the, the, the soft robot, the soft machine should look like. But of course, each cell is much more complex than your voxels that you have in your simulation. So, so how come that this transformation from silica to, uh, to living material works so well? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, I didn't have time to go into that. Um, the, the short answer is we sent a lot of blueprints to Doug and Doug just said, I can't build that. Or even if I build it, I know from biology, it's not going to work. So one of the things that the blueprints did was actually extract from Doug, the biologist, biological details that we then built back into the simulation to make these individual voxels a little bit more like cells. But one of the most surprising things to me is that obviously, even as we build in those biological details, those simulations still lack, you know, huge amounts of biological detail. And still, we were able to transfer from simulation to reality. So again, I think this points to the fact that living systems are accepting. They're, they're surprisingly willing to be manipulated into new forms and function and sort of learn that structure and then hold that structure and hold and maintain that behavior. It, it's almost like the cells are kind of getting to do. It's, it's kind of anthropomorphizing a little bit. Maybe we're attributing too much intelligence to the cells, but there's definitely some of that going on. And that, that is something we are definitely looking into in more detail at the moment. Thank you. That's that's fascinating thought, actually. Yeah. Um, there's a question in the audience. I think. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, hello. My name is Adi, and uh, I hope you don't mind me saying this was a very wonderful presentation. I'll be having nightmares about Thank this. I want Terminator take over. Um, my question you was. You won't be the first. You won't be the first. So uh, my question is, um, in the in the robot, it it appeared as if you tried to aim for. Um, uh, uh, you know, like one instruction, try to move in an infinite for loop. And it had other intrinsic processes, which were, as you mentioned, evolution, evolutionary embedded into the core of that, that system. So, uh, so I, I wanted to know, like, how much of the program can you program by your, is user defined and how much is evolutionary instinct? Because um, from what I have seen, um, it's not just defined, it's not just restricted to the function defined by its user, but also there is other intrinsic processes which um, could be either constructive or destructive or uh, disruptive in its uh, uh, behavior if there are more than one type of robot. So uh, what would be the next step in trying to make this program more complex in its behavior? Yeah, a great question, Adi. That's a, that's a great question. So we, we tend to distinguish between top design what I showed you today is top-down design, right? So Doug is coming in li literally from the top and he's trying to force shape and structure, uh, shape and behavior onto, you know, frog tissue. And the amazing thing is that that sometimes works. You can do that, but obviously it's kind of a, um, a not very satisfying way to reorganize living tissue into new form and function. So we are moving away from top 
top-down design to bottom-up design. So in bottom-up design, the evolutionary algorithm isn't evolving shapes. It's evolving ways to send signals into the cells. Basically, it's learning how to talk to the cells so that the cells will spontaneously connect and build some desired structure. That's bottom-up design, which of course is how biological development happens. Uh, we have signals in an embryo, signals coming from uh, the mother, coming from the DNA, coming from outside, coming from inside. It's not a top-down process. So one of the, the, the next version of this system that I showed you is the evolutionary algorithm says, I think if you apply this amount of current at this onto this cell at this moment, and then this electric current to that cell at the next moment, it's going to cause them to come together and grow and change and sort of figure out how to talk to the cells so that they grow useful structure, which if we can do it would be used from a robotics point of view, because it makes it easier for us to build these robots rather than imposing structure on them from above. Perhaps even more interesting in the long term, it becomes a scientific tool. It allows us or allows us to learn the language of cells. What is it that cells are listening to? What, what instructions cause cells to do to do what? And that's the aspect of this work that my biology colleagues are particularly uh, interested in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm pretty sure it's the force, but if not, it's something else. <laughs> Could be the force. We'll see. We'll see. Um, I have a question uh, coming in from the chat, uh, which I will read to you. Uh, you showed uh, Christoph Wagner was asking a question. You showed a video of a xenobot making more of itself from cells added to its medium externally. Uh, since cells can grow and duplicate, do you think that xenobots could also make more of itself internally? Uh, it's possible. Um, this is this is actually known as kinemation, and obviously there's a cartoon of it on the right here with traditional robots. The idea of kinematic self-replication in robotics has actually been around since the 1960s. Uh, John von Neumann, one of the pioneers of the computer age, you know, came up with this theoretical idea of a robot that builds robots that builds robots, and it does it kinematically, meaning it moves and reaches out into the world, finds building blocks, and externally builds a copy of itself, which is very different from biological reproduction, not replication, where in reproduction, of course, it's based on growth rather than kinematics. Uh, mammals grow their children inside, plants grow seeds on their outside. So it's possible, like you mentioned, that we could sort of combine these two approaches to produce offspring, that there's no reason why these frog cells couldn't uh, divide and, and grow more mass if we supply nutrients to them. It was just interesting that this particular project, we actually saw a xenobot on its own doing something that looked like kinematic self-replication. So we brought in the evolutionary algorithm to design the shape of these xenobots, and it came up with this kind of Pac-Man type shape. And you can see why this Pac-Man shape works pretty well. In this case, the AI was amplifying this kinematic self-replicative process. Um, but yeah, absolutely. There's no way, there's no reason why we couldn't combine uh, reproduction through growth with replication through kinematics. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a question in the audience. I have to tell you, you cannot see the audience because we don't have, uh, we have a problem with the camera that goes into the audience. My apologies for that. Um, but there is a question right over there. Hi, my name's Oliver. Uh, thank you for your talk. It's really extraordinary work you've done. I, I had a question perhaps a bit more related to the first part of your talk, but many uh, animals, like they do behaviors like parenting and uh, being part of a social group is a way to, to learn behaviors and, and even to walk, etc. So I was wondering, is there a role for those for, for parenting within kind of xenobots, probably later down the line, but also in these these uh, artificial life uh, algorithms? Yeah, a great question, Oliver. So sociality, um, you know, I, we kind of mentioned tongue in cheek. We're kind of joking when we say the parent xenobot and the child xenobot. These are all just, you know, frog cells in different, you know, uh, arrangements. There is definitely some social dynamics already at work here, but it's not at the organismal level, it's at the cellular level. So as I showed you in this video, 
cells don't like to be on their own. They, they tend to move and want to be in a group. So, you know, often when we're talking about, you know, we're talking about biology, we're often focused at the organism level. And we think about intelligent, the intelligence of animals or humans. We talk about social intelligence, social dynamics. But I think we often overlook that there, though there are forms of intelligence, of social intelligence that exist at the cellular and possibly the subcellular level uh, as well. And so I think we're act I think we're actually already maybe by mistake or unintentionally we're kind of exploiting or relying on the sociality of cells. They don't like to be on their own. They kind of want to build something. Um, what they actually build is kind of being influenced by, you know, the frog DNA and also from us from the top down. But I, I definitely think there, there's a role for trying to study the, the social dynamics going on in the system. At the moment, probably only at the cellular level, but perhaps in future at the organismal level as well. Great question. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Cassian. I'm also from the field of computer science. Um, I was interested, uh, or what I uh, thought was an interesting, uh, maybe possible application, is also what you're saying, this uh, kinematic uh, development combined with growth. Um, I stumbled across some articles a while ago about uh, applications of 3D printing to creating uh, organs, for example. Um, would like uh, this approach with Xenobots, would that be an alternative to the kind of ceramic uh, steel and, and glass world that uh, you mentioned um, of, um, of our existing approach to these kind of problems? Yeah, yeah, great, great point. So there is, uh, there is this exploding field of bioprinting. It's very exciting. So instead of 3D printing plastic, you can print uh, living scaffolds and cells will grow to eat and then sort of take on the shape of the scaffold. You're, um, we're becoming increasingly good at, you know, printing living structures like organs and, and uh, other, other body parts. But again, bioprinting is a type of top-down design. You're kind of trying to force this shape onto a mass of cells or push or pull or constrict these cells into a particular shape. My, my colleague, Mike Levin, who runs the Levin Lab uh, at Tufts University, particularly interested in uh, what he calls electroceuticals. So this is uh, meant to be in contrast to pharmaceuticals, drugs. So in, electro, in electroceuticals, is it possible that we can electrically stimulate uh, cells or patches of tissue? so that they regrow a damaged uh, organ or even regrow a whole limb. So it's kind of turning this idea of creating or regenerating lost limbs or lost organs on its head instead of printing them and then trying to introduce them into the human body. Why don't we try and convince the human body electrically to regrow stuff that it already knows how to how to grow? Um, the Levin Lab had a particularly exciting publication a few years, uh, a few months ago. They put an electric cuff onto the arm of a uh, frog. That frog was missing its arm. And after some electrical stimulation, that frog started to grow back its leg. And frogs, like us, are not a species that are capable of naturally regenerating their limbs. So the particular electrical signals is actually a combination of chemicals and electrical signals. That mixture was somehow telling the cells to restart this process. And I think, again, this work and related work is helping to uncover the language of cells. And if we could really understand the language of cells, we could move away from this top-down forcing on living systems. We could move away from bioprinting, from drugs, and we could move to a more natural solution where we simply convince the cells to do something that we know they're already capable of. Thanks. Thanks for the answer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hi. <laughs> 
sorry, that's so hard. Um, I'm Yonaka, I study biology, and I was wondering uh, how many groups are working on xenobots and if any other animals are being used at the moment. Yeah, great question. Um, how many groups are working on xenobots? I don't know, because in academia, usually you don't speak up until you have something to publish. Uh, the xenobots are only two years old, um, usually takes usually takes about two or three years to finish a, a project, a new research project in biology and get it published. So I really don't know how many other groups are now working on xenobots. Um, we are continuing our work with the Levin Lab. And um, as you can see on the slide here, we have moved beyond frogs to some other species. Um, you can probably guess which particular species we're particularly interested in. Um, but because we haven't published that work yet, I'm not at liberty to, to mention exactly what species and what cell types we're working with, but we're definitely trying to broaden, we're allowing the evolutionary algorithm to learn how to manipulate cell types from, from other organisms. We, uh, we look forward to publishing soon, so uh, stay tuned. Thanks for your question. Thank you. Oh, yeah, hi. Hi. Yeah, um, I'm Utku, and my question was about uh, something you mentioned. With um, you mentioned something about uh, how would life look like in other planets, uh, and um, moving on with that, um, I was wondering uh, if, if when you're when you were sim simulating these xenobots or uh, trying to simulate its uh, behavior, did you actually um, like? Um, condition its environment or uh, specify some other stuff or uh, for example uh, um, in the program itself did you specify environmental factors or um, is there work also being thought uh, is there work that's thought to be, be done about uh, what other planets um, would look like in conditions and how would uh, another organism would act like in another uh, environment then uh, in context of xenobots yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, my group has done a little bit of that, and there are a few groups that have worked on this. Um, so the simulated environments that I showed you, these are physics engines. Um, they were actually developed in response to the computer games uh, industry. Um, if you play a modern video game, they have very sophisticated uh, virtual worlds that contain pretty sophisticated physics. And of course, you can tune the physics, you can tune the gravity, you can tune the terrain to simulate Mars and Europa and Titan. Um, so we could play around with that. The, the problem, of course, is actually not so much simulating um, extraterrestrial environments. It's the lack of our understanding about the origins of life. And I saw that the, the first season of the late night conference series, you had a lot of uh, world experts who actually have studied the question of the origin of life. Um, so it's it's a little difficult to play that game unless we understand how life gets started. We can understand the biomechanics uh, in other environments. Obviously, if you're in a very high gravity environment, you need to keep a very low center of mass. Uh, if you're in a very low gravity environment, you can get away with you know flight and very high centers of mass. But beyond that, it's really difficult to to come to any firm conclusions about what life might look like. So. That's part of why I like the Xenobots approach to Xenobiology xeno is that it's it's real. We're, we're working with Terran material, we're working with Terran living systems, but we're allowing those living systems to recombine themselves in ways that look very different from the current tree of life. So I think, again, in future, there's just a lot of these different ways at getting at this question of life as it could be. And uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what what we uh, what we collectively come up with. Thank you. Yeah. See questions. Uh, yes, there's one up there. Hi, uh, my name is Lucas. Um, I had a question. Like um, within the creation of these random combinations, um, there is a selection process. I don't really understand how this selection process takes place. Like, do you? Um, select for uh like one outcome like movement in a one-dimensional plane um and are there other selection criteria you're looking for uh or is the program doing this itself yeah that, that's a great question so 
for those that are non-biologists, we in biology you often talk about selection pressure, right? So putting pressure on a population to do something. Um, in these first experiments, the selection pressure is very simple. It's it's selecting for just one behavior, which is movement from the left side of the petri dish to the right side of the petri dish. In exactly the same way we did with the evil starfish, it's evolved to walk from the light of the table to the right side of the table. There's a branch of evolutionary algorithms known as multi-objective optimization. And in multi-objective multi optimization, you obviously you're, you're selecting for multiple objectives. Move in this direction on flat ground, but when you come into contact with rough terrains, you can move in this way or move as quickly as possible, but also move in the most energy efficient manner uh, as possible. Um, so you can include, it, it, one of the nice things about playing with an evolutionary algorithm is you can add, move different kinds of selection pressures and see where the evolutionary algorithm directs the evolving uh, population. There's also a lot of great uh, web apps and web tools where you can actually play around with some of this. Um, my group runs a, uh, an evolutionary channel on Twitch, Twitch Plays Robotics. And on Twitch Plays Robotics, in chat, you can direct where the evolutionary algorithm goes. You can play around with placing different kinds of selection pressures on the uh, evolving populations of robots. Great question. Thank you. Sounds very cool. Thank you. <clears throat> I had a small question about um, the evil starfish. Yep. Um, because you said the, um, the evil starfish senses how the world pushes back at it. So I figure there's some sensors in there. What happens when there's damage to the sensors or even worse, if the, the sensors are damaged in a way that they give faulty information, how do you that recover? Is, yeah, that is a fantastic question. So the, the problem that you just identified is the problem that keeps NASA engineers awake at night, which is not just that something goes wrong, but that something goes wrong with the sensors, right? The worst possible thing a machine can do is give you a false positive. It tells you everything is fine when everything is not fine. The evil starfish doesn't have a good solution to that. So um, the evil starfish actually has just two sensors. It has two vestibular sensors. A vestibular sensor uh, records uh, orientation relative to gravity. So the evil starfish can sense how much its main body tilts left and right and how much its main body tilts forward and back. If one of those two sensors becomes damaged, this the whole algorithm falls apart. No one has a good answer to that. But I'll, I'll, I'll bring us back to an earlier discussion we had around the first question, which is in a living robot or an organism, it's basically a machine made of machines, made of machines, made of machines. You have a hierarchical organization. So if there is a serious problem at one level, like what you mentioned, a, a sensor fails, if, you, if the whole thing is made of smaller machines, that kind of that kind of hierarchical machine or that fractal machine has a better chance of recovering from a false positive than something like the evil starfish, which is not fractal. It just has two sensors and eight motors and th that's it, right? Then it's just dumb plastic and metals and ceramics. So I think the future of robotics, even if it's not cells, is building robots that are made of robots that are made of robots. If something goes wrong, it's unlikely that that robot is going to be confused or surprised at every level of its organization. That's just an idea I have. No one's tested it. No one's tried it. So for those uh, budding engineers in the audience, I think this is a great problem to tackle. Yeah, great, great observation. Great question. Thank you. Fun, fantastic lecture. Two more minutes. And I have two questions, so, so let's see if we can do that. There's one on the uh, in the chat, and then there's, I think, one right here in the front. So if you guys can move the microphone down, and I will read the one on the chat. Uh, it's uh, Bob von Slice, who says, uh, fantastic talk. What is the accuracy of the voxel model? Where does the model break if it does? Yeah, where does the model break? It breaks uh, in lots of, uh, lots of places. Um, the first place it breaks is, as I mentioned, cells are very mobile. Um, they're moving uh, throughout the body. They're actually migrating through the body. That's true in frogs, true in humans, true in xenobots. 
the voxels uh, that we simulate, they're kind of stuck together. They don't have an ability to move very much on their own, but there are thousands of other cellular details that are missing from the model. So it's not so much that the model breaks, it's just that the model at the moment is overly simplistic. Very clear answer. And then the final question right here in the front. Yeah, uh, hi, this is Anand. Uh, I'm from condensed matter physics. Yeah, I have a rather technical question uh, from the first uh, and the second part. Uh, in the first part, you mentioned about this uh, um, like artificial uh, evolution in the computer, right? So um, uh, is it like uh, uh, AI based, the neural network based, or is it like a big program that you have written and you're discarding all the time? Yeah, um, great question. Yeah, it, it's very, uh, an evolutionary algorithm is very different from a neural network. It's a very different kind of artificial intelligence. You can use an evolutionary algorithm to evolve neural networks. So you can sort of combine deep learning and evolutionary algorithms uh, in different ways. But the short answer to your question is they're, they're very different branches of artificial intelligence. Okay, and, and I, I, I think I can ask the second question. Okay, no problem. Running out of time, it's nine o'clock now. That's all we've got time for uh, today. Uh, Josh, thank you for a fantastic talk, very inspiring talk. There's many questions that people would like to ask you. We are, of course, looking forward to that next paper that uh, covers some of the other um, branches of life in there. Um, we're looking forward to a whole evolution of uh, Xenobots. Uh, so for now, thank you again. Fantastic presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And then, and then this, before we log off, I wanted to... Uh, uh, thank the audience for participating, uh, also the people in the, uh, in the chat, but also the people who made it work today. It's a lot of work to uh, make sure that the, uh, the sound, the cameras, everything else works. So uh, thanks a lot, team. Uh, it was great. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to our next meeting in a month's time. Uh, so see you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>